Hey guys, it's Shane from the Australian Karate Academy in Brisbane, uh, and I'm here with Joe Swift, uh, author, historian, translator, karate teacher, um, a man of many, many hats. So, uh, Joe, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Matt, um, just wanted to go through today a couple of uh, things uh, about your, the history of, of yourself, uh, how you came into karate in Japan. Um, delve into a little bit about the history of, of karate, uh, as well as your Itosu book, um, and any upcoming projects that you've got um, coming coming forward. So, uh, yeah, um, like a plan. yeah, look, uh, I met uh, I met you in 2005, I think it was, in, in uh, yeah. Japan. Uh, we had arranged to catch up in August this year, however, with the yep. coronavirus, uh, Obviously, we, we, we couldn't do that, so we thought we'd, we'd do a quick uh, discussion and um, see where it takes us. Sure. Um, so, Joe, yeah, just uh, tell us about yourself, mate. Introduce yourself, uh, where you started karate, and your karate in Japan. Sure. Uh, I'm originally from a town called Venet, New York, uh, population 500. I left, so it was 4.99. Uh, it's a joke I tell all the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I actually started, uh, I was interested in karate ever since I was a kid because uh, the local TV station every Saturday, they had what they called Kung Fu Theater. They would show these old cheesy Hong Kong Kung Fu flicks from the 70s. I said, I want to do that. Yeah. Then around 1985, I think it was, at the uh, wise old age of 12, I got word that a dojo had opened up in the town that I went to school in. I was uh, about a half an hour drive from home, but I went to school there, so after school activity, why not? Uh, sh showed up, joined, and never looked back. Uh, okay, now, at and that time, it was a school called Ishindu, which is an Okinawan style, uh, founded in 1956, I think it was, uh, based on Goju and Shorin and Kobudo. And uh, my instructor uh, was not a military man, uh, but Ishindu actually spread throughout the world uh, via the U.S. military. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I joined. Uh, he had a special program uh, because he just opened. Uh, it's thirty-five dollars a month, but if you sign up uh, and pay one hundred dollars up front, you get three months and a free uniform. So we went that way. Oh, that's yeah. a fantastic marketing in nineteen eighty-five. Yeah, uh, Let me the, write that down. of course, the uniforms back then were uh, kind of like student uniforms now. Like They're like t-shirt quality material, yep. but they were about $20, $25, I think, for uh, even the lightweight student uniforms. But so, yeah, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Uh, a year later, maybe it was only six months. Anyway, uh, my mother had discussed a lifetime membership with my instructor. And he said, sure, uh, here's how much it'll be. Uh, she paid because he was thinking, uh, this kid won't last. Uh, that's an easy, you know, X hundred dollars in my pocket. And I actually outlived the lifetime membership and uh, I'm still in close touch with him on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the rest is history, I guess. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, how long did you train with Ishin Rufo? Uh, it was uh, 90, sorry, 85 to 94 when I moved to Japan, so it's that nine years. Okay, and, yeah. and the obvious question, what, uh, what led you to Japan? Was it, was it karate? Uh, that was the main reason that I've always wanted to come to Japan was the martial arts. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual reason that I came to Japan is that I had a chance to do a year abroad as an exchange student. Uh, I discussed with the guidance counselors at university. They said, if you do a year in Japan, we will count that as all the credits you need towards a minor in the Japanese language. And so I did that. So I had to finish a uh, hard science major in three years. I didn't need alcohol and drugs to ruin my brain. Differential equations did that. Yeah. In the same, uh, in the same semester as physics three and uh, thermodynamics. So. No worries. and I see, I see, uh, I see that was um, put to good use now. Then, yep. Uh, actually, 
I'm probably one of the lucky few that got a job in the field that I studied. I studied meteorology, uh, so I'm a weatherman. Yeah. I can tell you, tonight's forecast is dark. Continue <laughs> mostly dark tonight, turning to widely scattered light in the morning. Fair uh, but uh, yeah, and I now work for a private weather company here in Japan. And yeah. uh, we've got our fingers in all of the pie, but uh, basically uh, using weather intelligence uh, to offset business risk. Okay. All right. And along different segments of and uh, uh, markets. So, so that that job gives you a bit of flexibility to you know research karate, uh, and run your own club. Where are you finding? No. Time? Uh, I'm going to use a very uh, antiquated but still uh, valid Americanism. I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, they're good about scheduling weekend work around the training times. Okay. Uh, by either giving me the weekends off or have me work the early shifts so that I can get back in time for uh, nighttime training. So, yep. Or putting me on the late shift so that I can get there after after morning training. So, yeah, they're good about that. Uh, everything else is I have a 90 minute commute on the trains. And so that's where most of my uh, book work gets done. I do a lot of reading, thinking, writing on the trains. Yep. So, uh, yeah, that's three hours a day that you have for, you know, sitting down and concentrating on, uh, yep. <coughs> pardon me, uh, anything that you're working on. So, yeah. Uh, the, um, and so just the normal 75 hour work week, is it in, uh, in Japan? Yep. 75 yeah. hour work day. <laughs> <laughs> work week yeah. Uh, yeah well we have a well i have a joke that i say uh, a lot of the northern european companies are very uh progressive in their working style right uh so you have by law maximum 37 hours a day uh, a week in yeah. a lot of the northern european countries right yep. and uh, i always joke 37 hours i do that on mondays alone <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yeah uh <clears throat> no uh right now with this uh COVID-19 crisis uh, going on around us, uh, most of our offices shifted to remote work, myself included. Uh, yep. So I think it's, uh, if, you, if you have a computer and a strong internet connection, you can do pretty much anything anywhere. Well, we can, uh, we if, can. It's, if it's technology-based. I mean, we can have an interview over the internet. Yeah, I mean, we. I think this whole uh, uh, coronavirus is, is going to change how we interact. Um, yeah whether it's from here in Australia to Japan or whether it's face-to-face. Yep. Um, -face. Right. Um, and I think, it'll, it, you know, uh, I mean, how many seminars have you seen online? Karate seminars, Kobudo seminars that everybody can just jump onto. Or if yeah. you can oh, pay a small fee. Yeah. Um, we didn't really think about it before. Right. So, um, of course, I mean, uh, uh, we, all, we all want that that. Yep. idea of contact and human interaction through the martial arts but <clears throat> who said it best? Miyagi Chojun said uh, karate doesn't require a great amount of time, space or special equipment. It, you don't even need a partner if you're going to train your kata. Right? And so I think putting the, the technology to use like that is a way to keep clubs together uh, you know in a spirit of camaraderie. You still yeah. get to talk yeah, for you sure. You just don't get to throw people on their heads. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I miss that part of it too. Yeah. Um, and I think it'll be a balance of both um, yeah. because you, you can't learn, you can't learn karate via Zoom. Um, right. you, can, you can practice karate, um, you can practice kobudo, and you can learn yeah. a kata, but you you can't learn karate. Yeah, I agree. You, know, you, you yeah. can't. You, don't, you, you can't learn the intricacies of, of this and that and, yeah. um, you know, and, and the spontaneity of learning something um, by yourself. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. Um, so, um, and what, uh, so how long have you been in Japan for? So, not, not so since 94, so it will be, oh my goodness, what's this year? 2020. It'll be 26 years in August. Good. 
but more than luckily, half my life. Luckily, you don't need counting uh, in your uh, field of expertise, do you? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why you got invented calculators, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah tell me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so twenty six years um, in in yeah. Japan. Um, so you you run your own branch. Yep. Uh, in ninety four, I went to university in Osaka, and I joined the non-official karate club they had there. The official yep. one was a, uh, a Shorokan based. The non-official one was a Shorindu and uh, Ryukyu Kobudo club. I say like, that's closer to what I've been learning than Shorokan is, so I joined that and uh, hung around with a great bunch of guys and gals for a year. Learned a couple of new Kobudo forms that I still practice to this day, actually. Yep. Uh, and uh, in 95, after graduation, I went back to the States for three months, uh, worked several summer jobs, uh, saved up a, a ton of cash and came back to Japan to find a school that would sponsor me for a cultural activities visa. Okay. Which basically means you're there to study some aspect of the Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. And in my case, it was martial arts. And, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I found the Mushinkan in Kanazawa, well, a suburb of Kanazawa called Nonoichi, for anybody who's interested. Uh, and it was a goju-based karate, and Okinawan kobudo, and uh, iaido, short sword, and jujitsu, and short staff, and all of that was also taught as separate arts. So it's not like an amalgam of everything in one. So karate is taught and trained as karate, jujitsu is taught and trained as jujitsu. Uh, in the curriculum. And uh, the uh, headmaster there, uh, Uematsu Sensei, uh, was kind enough to sponsor me for the visa, and I did that for a year. Mm -hmm. And once that was done, I found a job, and I just stayed in Japan. Okay. And how long were you with um, Kanazawa? I was in Kanazawa for about seven years. Uh, so the first year, it, it wasn't really an Uchideshi program like you hear about, but uh, I was in the dojo seven days a week. Uh, I lived in an apartment that was about a 10-minute bike ride from the dojo, so got a clunker of a bicycle. You know, work up, you know, good leg, uh, work up for the legs and your cardio when you get down there. Uh, spend all day in the dojo, come back, uh, go to bed, do the same thing the next day. Uh, that was the first year. And then after that, I was just there for the regular classes after work. And the weekend training, of course, yeah. Sounds like you're living the dream. I was. I, I actually don't know how it happened. <laughs> yeah. But uh, interestingly enough, about six years ago, uh, one of my old classmates sent me a uh, scan of our yearbook, senior yearbook. Uh, maybe it was in 20 years ago, a little, little while ago. But anyway, uh, for our senior yearbook, we had to write a little blurb about we were, where we see ourselves in 20 years. Yep. And exactly 20 years later, uh, I got this, this scan from the thing from an old classmate. And uh, I had written, I will be living in Japan, working as a meteorologist and doing martial arts. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, the seven fortuitous gods of Indian slash Chinese slash Japanese mythology must have been smiling upon me. Oh, there, we, yeah. there you go, mate. Yeah. So you are living your dream. Yep, and, I'm living my dream. And living everybody else's, uh, you know, their, their dream as well. Um, so yeah. what, what, um, what led you to opening your own branch? Uh, I moved to Tokyo for work, which is about a three-hour bullet train ride away from Kanazawa. And the bullet train is about uh, 20,000 yen one way, so uh, there's no way I was going to make it back every weekend. And uh, I talked to my teacher, and he said, hey, open up a little club, get one or two guys together, bang around so you can stay on top of it. And it just worked out that... Uh, it turned out to be 30 guys or so uh, that ended up uh, coming. So we got about 30 guys on the books. And we have a core group of students who come every time and then guys who just come for the tricky parties, which okay. is a very Japanese way of joining a dojo. 
And and when was that? That was in two thousand and one, two thousand two around. Okay. Um, and um, okay, two thousand one. So that would put me into Kanazawa at six years. Okay. Yeah. And so the, yeah. how have you how have you found being a Westerner um, running a karate dojo in oh. in Tokyo? We don't have a standalone building, uh, so we rent space at the local community centers uh, on a monthly basis. And I found that uh, I'm pretty much ignored because I didn't join the JKF. Yep. And I don't really uh, do the competition side of karate. Uh, I'll go to tournaments to help out as a referee uh, for Kobudo tournaments uh, for friends who are running them. Uh, but other than that, uh, <clears throat> I don't think that anybody in the JKF side of things even knows who I am. So they leave me alone, and I leave them alone. Uh, I know, I know they do because I know a couple of people in the JKF, and I know they they know who you are. Uh oh, but uh, that's that's yep. another that's another discussion. Um, <laughs> and and how have you found the Japanese uh, public? When I mean, when when somebody's coming to learn learn karate from you is there any any stigmatism there uh, not that i've experienced uh even the uh ex kyokushin guys who want to come and try uh we'll call it traditional karate for now because uh we can get to definitions later but uh, yeah. uh have been and i think this is probably uh, uh one of the interesting things about the kyokushin guys is it's drilled into them from day one that uh, what Sensei said is a uh, rule and there's no uh, pushback against it. And so they're very, uh, honestly, they're, they're very, I don't want to say humble in that regard, but uh, they don't bring out the old uh, Kyokushin is stronger because we can kick your leg off type of thing that you might imagine them doing. Yep. At least in my experience. So, uh, yeah, uh, they've all been there. Everybody who comes in as an experienced person wants to learn uh, the kobudo or, or the kata or something. Mm. And the newbies don't know anything about karate anyway. So uh, they say, okay, this must be what it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that brings me to, um, uh, in regards to your, to your branch, uh, uh, who, are your, who are your mentors? In, in regards to karate, obviously, uh, 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 my teacher uh, is my teacher, yeah. right? Wayne Master Sensei. Yep. Uh, my personal mentors, uh, I count uh, oh, several, but uh, some of the more, some of the closer ones, I count uh, people like Hokama Tetsuhiro Sensei, yep. uh, Murakami Sensei in Kyushu. Uh, he wrote a bunch of books about Bojutsu. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, Patrick McCarthy, of course, uh, Arakaki Kiyoshi in Utah, and uh, a guy I consider him a mentor uh, slash friend, uh, a guy named Kanna Yasunori Sensei. He's an Uichiryu and Kobudo guy based out in Chiba, and uh, we're close friends, and uh, I go to him for advice on running dojo and stuff because he's been at it longer than I have. Yep. And okay. he's also one of the technical advisors on the non-bojutsu part of my Kobudo curriculum. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, out of um, out of those guys, um, do, you, do you contact? Do you speak to them regularly via Zoom now, or you? you uh, it's a bit most different. of the most of the guys in Japan were using a program called Line if they're the younger guys, or you just pick up the phone. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, talk correct. to them. Uh, Hokama Sensei and Murakami Sensei are not very technically savvy. And so, uh, yeah. I mean, they don't have the old rotary phones or anything, but uh, <laughs> yeah, they've uh, most of it's uh, on the phone. Uh, Facebook Messenger, you can do like live chats like this. Yeah. Uh, it's another big one that uh, we use. And, uh, as often as possible, I try to meet with them, uh, which uh, for a lot of them is uh, only once a year or once every few years. Uh, but, you know, 
letters and phone calls uh, in between there keep us close. I, I know so, some of the the older generation, um, yeah. no email, no website, it's yeah. just, just a phone number. Yeah. And you just hope they answer. Hokoma Sensei is very much like that. Hokoma Sensei's students have built him a Facebook home, but he's oh, not yeah. involved with that at all. They, they put up photos and and everything when they have visitors, but uh, he's not directly involved with that. So if anyone's out there listening, uh, if you send a message to the Hokama Sensei's Facebook page, it will not get directly to him unless the students understand English and are able to translate it back to him or they print it out and bring it to him. Yeah. So that's not, he, he's not uh, directly involved with that. But he does answer his phone and he speaks English. He does answer his phone and he speaks English and he's got a fax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, and he's he's hilarious to talk to. Yes. Yeah. Um, now. Not so hilarious. Not so hilarious when he grabs you and puts you on the floor. No, no. I've. Um, I, I t I'll tell you a funny story. Um, when I was at, at one of his classes, uh, there was a. I was in a seminar with some um, Argentinians, I think, and mm -hmm. we we're doing vital points. And I know yeah. some don't work on me. I know yep. because my, my dad had tried for, for 20 years. Yep. And, uh, so I was with a Canadian uh, guy and he was trying them and I knew they didn't work. So yep. he's, he's digging in and, and I'm like, oh yeah, no, no, that's okay. Then he puts his hand up. Says, oh, oh, sensei, sensei, these are not working. So, so he'll come yep. and, come and he tries them on me and goes, oh, he, he's too big, too big. doesn't work. Yep. And walked off and I'm like, I'm yep. like, yeah, that's cool. Five minutes later, the next one, I'm like, oh no, this one, this particular point doesn't work either. So, yep. and the guy puts his hand up again, or yep. comes, he comes over, and I'm like, oh no, and he tries again, and he goes, oh, he's too big. And oh, mate, I was just embarrassed because the whole class stopped and looked. Yep. And uh, he's, he goes, oh, come this way, come this way. And so he's walking yep. me to the door, yep. and I thought, I'm getting kicked out. I thought, oh my God, I've embarrassed him. And, uh, and he, we're walking towards the door and I'm like walking inch at a time. Like, oh, what, what's, what's wrong, Sensei? What, what's, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, yeah, this way. And I'm like all the way to the door. And everybody stopped and looked at me and I would have just been bright yeah. red. And I thought, oh my God, what's my dad going to say? I'm getting kicked out. Of, yeah. Am I the first guy to get kicked out of this guy's dojo? And he walks me all the way to the door. And points up and says, can you pick that up? I said, oh, yeah. And he goes, oh, thank you. And walked off. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. So I walked back to the uh, Canadian guy. And he yep. goes, hey, I thought he was kicking you out. I'm like, yeah. Me too. <laughs> so, oh, shit. Wow. After, after that, mate, my legs were jelly. Yeah, too big for the vital points, but you can reach the thing on the top shelf. So Exactly, yeah. Exactly. You, did, you did have use. You weren't yeah. the best crash dummy, but... Uh, yeah, being six foot two, you know, uh, was yeah. has its advantages. But uh, yeah, geez, did I did I absolutely shit my pants? <laughs> um, but um, back to back to Japan. I just wanted to get yeah. your idea on um, what Japanese karate is. Uh, you, you said you're not with the JKF. Uh, yeah. Are the majority uh, karate associations, organizations, clubs within the JKF? Yeah, well, I'll say it's half and half and half. Wait, uh, you know, yeah, there's yeah. numbers again. Yeah. Uh, with the Olympics and the uh, introduction of karate as an exhibition sport for the Tokyo Olympics, uh, a lot of kids flooded to the JKF schools yeah. from other schools. Uh, the main, the Kyokushin Kaikan, the original Kyoshin group uh, led by Matsui Sensei was working with the JKF to get uh, Kyoshin fighters trained up to be able to uh, do JKF style kumite in the the Olympics. Oh wow! Uh, so that was a very big uh, onus for the onus. Is that the right word? Anyway, uh, it was a very big uh, push for the JKF to increase its uh, visibility and its uh, strength in numbers. Yep. Uh, and then. Uh, after weeks and weeks and weeks of balking at the idea of even uh, postponing the Olympics for a day, let alone a year, uh, IOC in Japan came to an agreement to extend it to next year. So uh, I think that there are probably a lot of JKF-style Zoom classes in Japan now. 
Okay. Or just imagining. Uh, but the other half is still the uh, full contact Kyokushin and its uh, offshoots like the Byakuren Kaikan or the Shidokan and the Seirokan, all those guys. Yeah. Uh, they're also very big, although they're not as big now as they were in the 70s from what I, I gather, 70s and 80s. And uh, what, what's the <clears throat> ratio of children to adults? Uh, goodness, I would imagine that uh, in the average dojo, there's more children than adults because most adults are busy working and making a living. Yeah. And uh, much like uh, in the West, I think that uh, in some regards, karate and uh, the like are regarded as children's activities. Yeah. Uh, that you start in elementary school and then you uh, stop after you uh, move into middle school. Uh, what happens is in middle school, everybody has to join a school club. Yeah. And so, uh, if you join the school club that's related to the martial art or the sport that you are already doing uh, as an extracurricular activity, uh, then you're one of the lucky ones. Uh, like if your school does have a karate club, uh, then you can continue in that way. Uh, or it's seen as something that you join a club in at school and once you graduate from university, uh, then you retire and you uh, go into work the workforce as a uh, cog uh, a, uh, a cog in the wheel of uh, corporate Japan mm. I would say I would imagine that at least in my experience there are a lot more kids than adults training in karate uh, even in the Kyokushin schools the we're lucky um, yeah. where my dojo is in Brisbane um, mm. there's a big Japanese community two minutes up the road yeah. um, so we, we have a lot of Japanese kids that train with us. And yeah. one mum told me um, a, a few years ago uh, that she wants her son to do karate when he was a kid. Um, yeah. And then when he's in high school to learn a real, a real martial art. <laughs> I said, okay. What, what, did, what did she qualify as a real martial art though? Boxing or kickboxing. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Something, for, something for self-defense. Uh, yeah. What could, what could I say? You know, yeah. I was like, okay. And I said, is that the general consensus in Japan? She said, oh, yes. She said, karate is for kids. Yeah. And uh, the, there is also a very big uh, contingency of MMA style gyms in Japan. Yep. I, Japan founded MMA, I think we could say, with the shoot boxing and the uh, Yep, I, the Sayama I, Satoru and all the wrestlers back then that that yep. got together with the boxers and the kickboxers and formed, you know, big organizations that yep. were, to my understanding, they were meant to be a pushback against the uh, farcical side of professional wrestling. Yes, I I remember and, the leotards. Yep. Um, and it w there were no weight categories. This is uh, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. My, my dad and I used to watch the VHS tapes, and yeah. uh, it was always Japan versus America, or yeah. um, no weight categories, and yeah. the, the spandex and uh, yeah. uh, no rules, but you know, maybe yeah. one or two rules. Um, yeah. Fish hooking was fine. Maybe no eye gouges, but yeah. if they're on the ground, you stomp their head. Um, yeah. the big throws over the top anything anything went yeah so uh, uh, that yeah so uh, I think that 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 kind of uh, combative sport uh, has always had a big following in modern Japan uh, professional wrestling is immensely popular as well and I'm talking about like the, the Hulk Hogan style professional wrestling yeah, you know, with the big over-the-top characters and the the comedic skits before and after the the matches. Yeah, the ketchup uh, packets hidden in the in the hand so that it looks like you gouge a guy's uh, forehead open with uh, your fingertips or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll have to remember that for one of my videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and what is what about uh, the difference between Japanese karate and Okinawan karate? Uh, that is a. We don't have three hours to. And that's a can of worms, uh, but I'm going to say that uh, 
what Japanese karate is there now. Is, what, there is, yeah. Uh, I'm going to say uh, on the surface level, uh, the emphasis on competition versus the emphasis on self-development. Uh, the emphasis on competition, of course, being the Japanese side. And the emphasis on going to the dojo just to sweat and bang forearms with your buddy and you know just do it because it's there uh being more the i don't say the okinawan model because i hate when people say the okinawans say this and the okinawans do that because you can find as many exceptions to those as you can um but uh just a general idea i guess uh would be that comes to mind I, they all wear the white dogi and use the dan and q system and they have you know a dojo with an altar at the front and so the cultural trappings part you know what you wear and what you say when you're training uh it's probably 99 percent the same yeah uh, of course uh, you do have the the a lot of the okinawan schools still focus on actual physical physically conditioning the body in terms of contact exercises, you know, forearm banging, hit the makiwara. Whereas in a lot of the karate clubs in Japan, especially the JKF uh, ones, they don't have a lot of that because you don't need to do that for JKF competition. Sure. And in fact, it might be detrimental because you might actually accidentally hit the guy too hard and get disqualified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, things like that. But uh, I think uh, there is a push in some of the Japanese JKF schools, like the Gojukai, to kind of, I don't want to say completely return, but get back closer to the Okinawan roots. Yep. And so several years ago, the Gojukai uh, actually sent their instructors to Okinawa, to the Jundokan, to have their kata corrected. <laughs> yep. And... Uh, but uh, the caveat here is that if you do have your kata corrected, uh, the Jundokan as a Gojukai guy, if you're not also doing the Chi Shi and the, yep. the Nikirigame and all of that, then you're just mimicking the outside movements and you're not getting the the uh, the training of the specific muscle groups and tendon groups that you need to make that kata work yep. as far as the biomechanics are concerned. Uh, so... There is that uh, aspect to it, uh, but I would say that you know emphasis on competition or not is the biggest difference that I would see. Yeah, uh, if we're just looking at the the overall picture. Yeah, it's a it's a yeah. big it's a big question that that could be, you know, that could be a that, that could, could be a, a <laughs> could be yeah. a, a five hundred page book in there somewhere. It, it could be. It could be. Yeah. That's that's my of, last question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. So the um, so do you do you go to Okinawa often? Not as often as I used to, uh, but I did start recently going again once a year uh, a couple of years ago, and then this whole coronavirus fiasco happened. Yep. Uh, but uh, when I was going there often, I was going maybe five or six times a year. That's when when I was back living in Kanazawa. Yep. Uh, and I didn't have a real job. Or I did have a real job, but it was easy to get time off. Yep. Uh, or I just popped down for the weekend. You know, last flight on Friday night, first flight on Monday morning. You don't miss a you don't miss a minute of work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. and you got the weekend in Okinawa. But uh, yeah. recently, the last two times I went was with the All Japan UQ Kobudo Federation. Yep. Which is a a group of like-minded individuals. I've heard that somewhere before. Uh, did you guys who do Kobudo? Yeah. Hmm? Did you found that? Um, uh, I was one of the founding members. There's like ten of us. Okay. Uh, and uh, we went down the first time on the invitation of a man named Yogi Kiyoshi. Was an yep. Oichi Dui and Kobudo guy in Nishihara. In fact, his dojo is just behind Hokama Sensei's dojo. And they're very close friends. Uh, and so uh, we went down, uh, a group of the uh, board members and some of the younger guys went down, uh, spent three days in Okinawa 
doing the tour of the historical sites. Uh, we did a big uh, group demonstration slash exchange of techniques and painful things at Hokama Sensei's dojo. And nights were spent uh, pounding back more awamori than you can shake a new choco at. But, uh, I think that's the, then, uh, that's yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of training, but we did put on the dogi and do some kata and, and whack each other around and get thrown by Hokama Sensei. So that was fun. Uh, second, when I went down last year, it was for the unveiling of the bronze statue of Uechi Kanbun yep. in his the the town where he was born. Uh, that was also along with the Kobudo guys. And I stayed a few extra days and I caught up with a Goju mentor of mine, uh, trained at his dojo, uh, caught up with some old friends, and just had a, a blast. Yeah, I'm supposed to be going down this November. But that's kind of iffy, uh, depending on how this whole thing turns out. But uh, yeah, yeah, I find myself catching up with friends more than I find myself actually going to this dojo and that dojo yeah. uh, to to do the. I, I have a teacher, and I trust him with my life, and I have my mentors who I see every time I'm down there. And if I do meet up with some other guys that I'm I'm uh, close with and. Uh, the Sai and the Nuchuk do, do come out in the backyard and we start swimming around. Hey, you're training. Yeah. But, you know, I don't, I'm not going there to find affiliation with a new dojo or anything like that. So it's more of a personal journey anymore. Yeah. And, you know, pick up some new uh, newspaper article photocopies from the 1890s and all that. Yeah. And maybe a, a new photo of Hitosu. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that brings me to your uh, the book, your your famous uh, that's the one that's the one. Is it famous? Heritage. Yeah. Um, how long how long had you been uh, had, had you been researching that book? I mean, oh I'm, my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> um. Almost twenty years. Yep. And every time I thought I was done, I found something new. And I said, all right, that's it. I'm just going to stop here for now and do a second edition if more stuff comes out later. Yeah. Uh, that being said, a, a German gentleman, uh, guess what was his name? Let me pull his thing uh, up here. Uh, yeah, Thomas uh, Feldman. Yeah, yep. Yeah. He's <laughs> working on a biography of Ito Sensei as a human being. And yeah. uh, he's finding some interesting things that he's sharing with me that didn't okay. make it in my book because I didn't have them at that time. Well, I think, yeah, one of the fascinating things and maybe something that keeps people, um, keeps karate guys um, engaged in learning more about karate is you just, it's just constantly um, evolving. It's kind of yeah. like the coronavirus, you know, one, yeah. one week is different to the next week with stuff that yeah. yourself, Andreas Quest, um, uh, write and, and find out from an old newspaper clipping and then you put those two together and all, all of a sudden um, yeah. something new um, comes out and you know like my dad's been doing karate for 50 years and, yeah. and he's he's still I'm telling him things that he didn't know before Yeah, and I uh, think a lot of it was because the nobody bothered to go and look for the old newspaper clippings or they knew about this document, but they didn't connect it to karate. Or they knew about that that particular historical instance that they didn't really connect to, you know, bojutsu or whatever. Uh, so I think uh, until recently, I want to say in the past 30 years, you know, with uh, people such as uh, uh, Patrick McCarthy doing his initial uh, translations of these these old documents, and connecting the dots that nobody was looking big picture history. Mm. They were taking bits and pieces and, and putting them together into a little, a little cohesive yet somewhat romantic sounding story of uh, the farmers defending themselves against marauding samurai. Yep. Right. Uh, I, knew, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out that the actual history is much more fascinating Yep. and has nothing to do with that. Uh, but uh uh, one of my favorite guys to talk to is a an Irish gentleman here in Tokyo, uh, 
and he's a historian by uh, training. He's got a doctorate in uh, historical research. Uh, so he's a PhD in history, basically. Uh, and I like talking to him and he likes talking to me because we bring out all these little things and we try to find the, where they fit in the big picture. Yeah. Uh, so we do know that uh, karate was never illegal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We do know that the swords were not banned per se. You just couldn't take them out of your house. Yep. You know, things like this. Uh, we know that now, uh, but a lot of times it wasn't what what we are seeing in the study of Ryukyuan history didn't necessarily mesh with what we were seeing as a history of karate. And it, one of them has got to be wrong. Yep. Or or misremembered or mis, misrepresented or just misunderstood. And well, I think that that happens yeah. a lot with the oral traditions as well. I don't think that anybody's lying when they're talking about the oral traditions of karate history. We just don't have the historical and cultural context to put the pieces in place yet. Yeah. Well, a couple of really fascinating things that you wrote in the book. Um, yeah. And for, for, for me and for, and for our, um, it's called style of karate. Um, yeah. It's the, the Kinja Hiroshi link. And yeah. um, uh, so, so a couple of really fascinating things is uh, we talk about the uh, we didn't talk about this earlier, but the um, yeah the the Ryukyu or the Okinawan royal royalty and their mm -hmm. and their connection with karate, you know, their yeah. connection with the Te and the lack of um, the average Joe, um, not you obviously, um, yeah, yeah, the, the average dude learning learning karate you know yeah. it, it was it wasn't done it, it, yeah. was, it was a pitching or the royalty oh we'll call it the gentry right the 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 paging class uh what would be considered the samurai class in mainland japan yeah although they didn't function as full-time soldiers in okinawa some of the job description of some of the guys was to be part of a militia to protect the island against marauders. Yep. And uh, I've been thinking on this and trying to find the documentation to back it up. I read a little tidbit somewhere that after the Satsuma invasion, uh, swords were not banned per se. If you had a sword, you could keep it. You could practice with it. In fact, we'll teach you how to use it kind of thing, but you can't take it out of your house. The only weapons that were actually banned were firearms. Nobody in Okinawa could own a firearm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you could have your sword and your halberd and your your spear and all of that jazz. But uh, who the I'm trying to find the documentation that the the self defense militia of the Ryukyu Kingdom was actually trained in Japanese style battlefield tactics by the Satsuma. Yeah, I read that somewhere in some article about the sword trade between UQ and China. And I want to find the guy and, and uh, ask him uh, more about uh, where he got that, you know, what the source is and everything, but uh, see if we can't fit that together. Because the Satsuma didn't have a full-time regiment of soldiers in Okinawa to protect it against invaders. Yep. But they didn't also say you're on your own. They said, we'll, we'll get you up to speed on, you know, because you still have things like pirate attacks and all that jazz. Mm. Uh, that you need to be aware of, but uh, so the the Japanese connection that has hitherto been either not fully researched or willfully ignored is mm. coming to light. Um, and yeah. you know the uh, with our with our uh, uh, connection with Kinjo Sensei, he um, yeah. through Matani Sensei always talking about um, the footwork from the Satsuma. Yeah. Um, yeah, how, and, how, and how it applied to karate, and how it was influenced yep. into into the into the pinan kata, for example. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, like it was fascinating. Um, yeah. And a, a couple of other things um, was the uh, the Japanese government or the the Meiji uh, government mm -hmm. massive influence that it had on the karate system and karate as, as we know it now. Yeah, uh, 
interestingly enough, when I was doing this project and I was looking at these newspaper articles from the 1890s, where they're actually describing public demonstration of karate, yeah, uh, there were in the newspaper, the Ryukyu Shinpo newspaper, uh, the first newspaper in Okinawa, uh, founded by Sho Jun, one of the sons of, I think, the fourth son of the last king, Shotai. Anyway, he founded the the newspaper as a vehicle through which to modernize Okinawa Prefecture and get it caught up to the rest of Japan. Yep. And within there, there were two different distinct ways that they were talking about karate or uh, martial arts, local martial arts. One of them, if it was connected with uh, some kind of like military parade or some kind of uh, Japanese military or government run program, it was described in positive terms. Mm -hmm. If it was talking about the other side, the former aristocrats who left Okinawa to go to China to ask for Chinese intervention uh, in the whole uh, governmental takeover of uh, the Ryukyu Kingdom and uh, turning into Okinawa Prefecture, it was described in negative terms. So, so the so that was fascinating. But uh, the was an agenda already back in the eighteen nineties. Fake yes. news. Uh, yes, the the agenda was. Uh, it seems to me, anyway, uh, that, that looking at the UQ Shimpo's uh, founding and the reason it was founded, uh, that the easiest way to turn public opinion towards something new is to discredit the old. Yeah. Right? And so if you're describing karate as part of the new Japanese military spirit that is going to help us win the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War, mm. uh, then, of course, you, you praise it as something that is useful to the country. If it's being used as a tool to shape uh, young minds against that, then, of course, you describe it in negative terms and mm -hmm. turn the, the public's opinion against the, the we'll call them the, uh, the stubborn party, I think they were called. Yeah. Uh, the guys who wanted to maintain uh, Ryukyu and independence or uh, be absorbed into China officially. But, of course, China was, you know, in major decline at that time. Yeah. And uh, the Ryukyu kingdom wasn't really even on their mind. And, you know, they weren't it was neither here nor there. And yeah. history shows us that, uh, okay, now uh, Okinawa Prefecture is uh, politically, uh, in addition to culturally, uh, part of Japan. It's uh, fascinating that karate had such an impact. Um, I mean, I, I can't believe that there are newspaper clippings about, you know, yeah. Itos it about Itosu and, and all, all of the, um, the famous karate um, yeah. uh, there's, it just wouldn't happen today. Yeah. Obviously, uh, karate, tei, ti, whatever you want to call it, had a massive uh, presence in Okinawa. Yeah, uh, at least in that era uh, where they were trying to yep. uh, revamp it into uh, a tool to help the nation in its uh, modernization process. Yep. Um, yep. And... Um, and, and and from from the Japanese influence, uh, in, in your book you talk about um, yeah. it was the the Japanese government who created the PE or well um, who, the karate was a pilot program bef before judo and kendo. Um, yeah, I didn't yeah. I didn't realize that I didn't know I, I just assumed karate came after the judo and the kendo. Yep. Yeah, uh, that is a logical conclusion. I didn't really know it either until I read it in Hokama Sensei's timeline of karate history, uh, where he said, uh, 1911, judo and kendo become part of the official school PE program. Mm. I'm like, wait a second here. Yeah. And I looked into it and, and uh, it was, of course you had extracurricular clubs that did judo and kendo, I would imagine, uh, but not as part of the actual physical Mm. Uh, educational program uh, and so I think that sorry that's my cat Gogan Yamaguchi <laughs> uh, sorry 
bad joke. Um, or was that? Oh yeah. Um, and I concluded tentatively that a maybe karate was the pilot program to see if martial arts in the uh, education system w- would work. Mm. And apparently it was successful enough to then allow the introduction of judo and kendo into the schools, the middle schools for the rest of the country. Uh, yeah. yeah. So blew then, my mind. The, the rest, the rest is obviously uh, history and, and how it was, you know, altered, changed um, yeah. for, the general, for the general public and more specifically for, for school children. Um, yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, this, um, is, is this, yeah. and, uh, this is yeah. this. Um, uh, I think, uh, when it comes to the changes that happened, uh, there were the conscious changes like changing this to this yeah. and bringing your kick up here instead of down there. Mm. Uh, but, uh, I think that, uh, one of the other things that we need to, uh, bring into the equation is the changes that happened through the abolishment of the so-called warrior classes yep. that the martial arts were part and parcel of and the removal of that style of uh, physical and uh, movement education and more towards a Western sporting style of military exercises and, you know, running and, and you know, cricket and all of that jazz. Uh, whatever it was, uh, that actually made it uh, virtually impossible to replicate the old, the older usage of the biomechanics, of biomechanics or biomechanics, but how you use them and how they're 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 uh, part and parcel of a culture uh, depends, in my experience, on uh, the cultural trappings and the upbringing of the youth. For example, none of us rides a horse every day into work. Mm. None of us, you know, uh, wears clothes that are so restrictive that you literally cannot cross your shoulders against your hips or your clothes come undone and you're naked, you know, 10 10 steps down the street. And so in that regard, our bodies are not ready to do the kata the way that the kata were were formulated in Mm. the cultural trappings of the Ryukyuan and the Japanese uh, warrior classes. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the one of the biggest things is you know the the big uh, the big uh, hip turning in the the reverse punch like is uh, emphasized in JKA Shorokan as uh, as uh, described in a a uh, what do you call those things? A book by Nakayama Sensei. Uh, that famous picture. Yep. Yeah. Uh, would be very difficult to pull off if you're wearing your street clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Or your your everyday attire that you wore as a paging class person who went to work in the castle. Everything's restricted. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, if once you you see the uh, the movement patterns, and I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, but once you see like the movement patterns of the non-martial Japanese performing arts mm-hmm. as were developed and spread amongst the samurai class, and I'm talking about things like dancing, the tea ceremony, yep, all of these things. Uh, and even the way that the the actors are trained to walk on the the no stage and the kabuki stages mm-hmm. uh, is completely different from what you see in modern kendo, judo, and karate do and aikido. And I want to say that one of the biggest differences is the keikogi is way too free in its movement to bind you into that mm-hmm. movement pattern. Mm-hmm. which is uh which is good but it's also uh in a way sad that uh 
for those of us who are interested in karate as a cultural asset and want to know how Bushi Matsumura and how Higao no Kandyo actually moved in their daily lives, mm. uh, let alone combat, uh, it kind of gets away. And the second thing is with the tea ceremonial that you cannot sportify the kata. Yep. Whereas in karate and kendo, well, kendo doesn't do kata for sport, but they have, you know, 10 simplified kata that they do for gratings. Uh, but uh, the kata of karate do lend themselves to a, a an interpretation uh, in the competitive sense mm. where the aesthetics uh, override everything else. And in that case, you know, the, the, the snappy hip uh, movements and all of that, they look really good uh, on the competition stage. But uh, I am not sure that that is how Bushi Masamura would have done the same kata. Mm. 